Hello everybody, good evening and welcome. This is the next in our occasional series of book panels which brings together historians currently working on a prominent subject to discuss and debate their work. For this session we're focusing on new historical writing on neoliberalism, a subject that's recently produced a wave of monographs and collections exploring the topic from national, transnational and global perspectives. Neoliberalism tends to be viewed as a political and economic ideology rising to dominance in the later 20th and early 21st centuries, closely associated with the political right, and particularly pronounced in the UK, North America, Australia and Latin America. This evening we'll be exploring this popular understanding with the help of five historians who are at the forefront of the historicization of neoliberalism. I'm delighted to welcome them now. First, joining us from the US, we have Miriam Halle Davis and Quinn Slobodian. Miriam is Associate Professor of History at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she specializes in histories of development, decolonization and race in North Africa. Her latest monograph, Markets of Civilization, Racial Capitalism and Islam in Algeria, was published last month by Duke University Press. Quinn teaches at Wellesley College, Massachusetts, where he's Professor of the History of Ideas. Quinn has written extensively on neoliberalism, including his 2018 book, Globalist, The End of Empire and the Birth of Neoliberalism. He has co-edited several edited collections on the history of neoliberalism and has a new book arriving early next year called Crack Up Capitalism. Miriam and Quinn are joined by two historians from the UK. Barry Gerstel is Professor of American History at the University of Cambridge and the author of major studies on modern American government and democracy. His new OUP book, the Rise and Fall of the Neoliberal Order, America and the World in the Free Market Era was published this year. Our fourth panelist is Florence Sutcliffe Braithwaite from UCL, where she's Associate Professor of Modern British History. Florence is the editor of the 2021 collection, The Neoliberal Age, Britain Since the 1970s, which explores the political origins and influence of neoliberalism in the recent past. Lastly, it's my great pleasure to introduce James Fernan, who will host this evening's panel. James is the Helen Fawcett Distinguished Professor of History at the University of California, Berkeley, and has been central to the planning of this event, for which we're very grateful, James. James's own work on neoliberalism looks at Britain via the case studies of UK higher education and of Heathrow Airport, on which he published in Past and Present in 2021, and which forms the subject of his next book. Before I hand over to James, I'll just let you all know that we will be um, inviting questions from the floor, and there's a questions and answer um, icon down here at the bottom of Zoom, and we do encourage you to put all your questions to any of the panellists in there, rather than in the chat, as that makes it a lot easier for us to uh, keep a track of them. Uh, but that's enough from me. I'm handing over to James. Uh, thank you very much, and here's James. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks so much for um, joining us today. And thank you, Emma, for um, introducing us and to Philip and Karen um, behind the scenes for making this um, event possible. Um, before we begin, let me just say um, it's wonderful to see how well the Royal Historical Society has transformed itself from the selective club it was when I left Britain over 20 years ago to a proper professional society today. And perhaps now that we're revisiting the history of the monarchy and its complicity in slavery and imperialism, the next step may be to shed its royal patronage. Now, the British Historical Society does certainly have a nice ring to it. Um, now that I've lost um, my knighthood, um, let me just say um, how delighted I am to be part of this conversation with historians whose work I've long admired um, and learned from. Um, our aim today is to try and convey to you some of the questions and debates that have made the history of neoliberalism such an exciting field of study over the past um, decade or so. Um, so here we go. And we're going to begin, I think, with a question um, uh, to you all, um, asking to clarify what neoliberalism actually is, what we think we are talking about. Um, one of the debates that surrounded the history of neoliberalism is that different scholars and different theoretical traditions define and approach it in different ways. Some people believe that that makes the term at best unhelpful and at worst incoherent. 
So the work of our panel actually reflects some of that diversity of approach. So to begin the conversation, I want you all to briefly explain what you take neoliberalism to mean in your own work. And because one impossibly large question isn't enough to begin with, let me sneak in two more. Um, it might be helpful in your responses if you also explain why you've chosen to use the term neoliberalism as opposed to some of the other terms that historians um, sometimes prefer, like market fundamentalism or market liberalism. So that's the second question. And then the third question, finally, is because, again, your work is pushing in different directions on this. It might be helpful if you could address the relationship or the difference between liberalism in its classical 19th century form and neoliberalism. So um, who would like to begin? We didn't figure out the starting order. Quinn, why don't you start? OK, sure. Yeah, thank you, everybody, for coming and for um, tuning in to us hashing this out. Neoliberalism, I was trying to think of what it's like. It's kind of like an algae or something, right? It's like, a, you know, you get algae blooms in lakes, and I feel like it kind of functions like that somehow. Um, so I'll do this very quickly, as quickly as possible. I think that, that neoliberalism basically gets used in about four different ways, and it's impossible for me to say why I use it the way I do without saying other ways it's used and why I don't use it that way. I think the one way it's used as, is as a kind of form of periodization to sort of talk about a neoliberal era that sort of began at a certain point and then may or may not have an ending point. Uh, another way of discussing it is as a kind of a package of policies, so a kind of 12 point list for dismantling the welfare state, the sort of Washington consensus laundry list of privatization, deregulation, liberalization, and so on. A third way I think it gets used is as a kind of form of subjectivity or of self understanding. So to be neoliberal is to feel a certain way about oneself, to be an entrepreneur of oneself, to see yourself as a kind of a bundle of assets to be capitalized on and speculated on and leveraged and so on. And then fourthly, the way that I use it is, it, I, I would say, it's a much more minimal definition, which is uh, to describe a specific intellectual movement that sprang up in the 1930s, 1938, a group of people got together and coined the term neoliberalism to describe the path they were trying to weave between socialism and communism on the left and fascism and nationalism on the right to defend and reinvent liberalism for a modern era of universal suffrage and increasing uh, the increasing uh, dissolution of large um, multi-continental empires. So my own definition, and so I, hopefully I've answered the classical liberalism question in, 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 as, I, as, I'm, as I'm talking here, but my own definition sticks quite closely to that. So to, to think about neoliberalism as a kind of ongoing set of conversations among a fairly discrete number of people over a fairly long period of time within which there's a great deal of variation. And there's enough pointers, I think, to not help explain why the world has become the world we uh, inhabit, but to at least provide some sort of spotlights and ways of thinking about the relationship between states and markets, the relationship between populations and their own governments, and the relationship between the institutions that have come to govern global capitalism. So I think I'll leave it at that. Florence, is you something of a skeptic? Maybe it'll be good if you um, you go next. Um, yeah, I'm really pleased that Quinn went first because I I have to say I actually really agree with the way that he's just outlined of of using the term neoliberalism. Um, thinking back to your question, why do we use the term neoliberalism? I suppose in the book that I edited, um, and I think it is significant that I co-edited it with. Ben Jackson, who is obviously an intellectual and political historian primarily, and Alan Davies, who is a kind of economic and political historian. So we're kind of coming, coming at it from a lot of different angles. We chose the title, The Neoliberal Age, question mark, in part because this is just such a common way of narrating Britain in this period. So there's a sort of, um, I mean, there's an obvious kind of uh, attention grabbing uh, and kind of promotional reason to use that term in the title of the book. 
Um, and, and a lot of what the book does is, I think, to undermine the, um, the categorization of Britain since the 1970s as a neoliberal um, age. So I think there's obviously a lot of different perspectives in the book, but um, the perspective that I personally take and the perspective that I think quite a lot of the contributors to the book take, and by the way, you can all download the book for free from the UCL Press website, got to get a plug in there, um, is, is to think about neoliberalism in this minimal sense as a, a set of evolving doctrines, and then to see that set of ideas um, sometimes in more kind of subtle forms and sometimes in more kind of bastardized simplistic forms um, as sometimes having an influence on British politics, political economy and, and even potentially subjectivities, but as only one set of influences among many. Um, Gary, why, why don't you go next? Because the neoliberal age or neoliberal era is very much an important feature of your um, of your um, recent fabulous book. You're muted. So I get to say thank you, James. Um, <laughs> now you can hear me and thank to the Royal Historical Society and maybe the British Historical Society to be uh, for this invitation and to my fellow panelists this opportunity to talk about uh, neoliberalism. I found Quinn's <clears throat> identification of four ways of thinking about or the four uh, four ways in which historians and other scholars use neoliberalism to be very helpful and um, I think I probably use it much more expansively than uh, Quinn does. Uh, not that his identification of the group of intellectuals coming out of 1930s and 40s Europe aren't important. They're central to the story, and he has written about them brilliantly. But I'm, I think, more interested in how expansive and how protean neoliberalism became and what enabled an ideology that had sp pretty specific roots uh, to become so important, so hegemonic, and to define the terrain on which uh, many Americans from many different walks of life were doing their politics. Uh, I'm really most interested in how a set of ideas migrates from a specific set of origins, uh, how it merges with older American traditions of liberalism and why it develops not only an elite set of strategies, but a popular base that allows it to dominate politics for uh, a very long period of time, uh, 30 to 40 years. In the process of uh, writing the history, this, the, the history not just of neoliberalism, but the neoliberal order, and the two are distinct. You can have neoliberalism surviving into a period when there is no longer a neoliberal order. I think that would describe the moment that I think we're in right now. But part of what I've tried to do is to connect the history of neoliberalism to the longer history of liberalism. And one of the, the, there's a really rich literature on neoliberalism now uh, spanning multiple disciplines. And part of the excitement of the book that I my excitement of, of my the experience of doing the book was to encounter so many of these different li literatures. But one of the strange features of these literatures is that very few of them pause to think, uh, what is the relationship of neoliberalism to classical liberalism? And I think one of the reasons not sufficient attention has been paid to that is because too many people who study neoliberalism accepted the claim of the original neoliberals themselves that theirs was an utterly new form of liberalism that was not closely connected to classical forms of liberalism, which were disparaged in their eyes as laissez-faire. And their liberalism was gonna be new because it was gonna be intelligent. It was gonna use the state in strategic ways. It was gonna organize markets uh, and states in ways that laissez-faire liberalism had failed to do. Uh, the problem with that point of view is we've had such a rich literature on classical liberalism emerging in the United States and elsewhere, and it shows that much of what the neoliberals thought was new was in fact being used in uh, 
the 19th century. Uh, so that's one way in which neoliberalism is connected to uh, liberalism. Another feature of what I've tried to do is to point out that neoliberalism is not the first new liberalism to emerge in the 20th century. There was a new liberalism by that name broadcast in Britain by Hobson and Hobhouse. There is the liberalism of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Dealers in the 1930s, which imagines it's doing the same thing as the neoliberals see themselves as doing, finding a middle way between the collectivisms of the right and left. And even though the influence uh, of these earlier new liberalisms generally is not acknowledged by the neoliberals, it shapes the world in which they are striving to have a voice and striving to uh, gain influence. And from the start, they have to struggle against uh, not only their enemies on the left and the right, but they have to struggle against and distinguish themselves from other groups of new liberals who have gotten there first. And that renders the terrain of neoliberalism, in my view, much messier and much more subject to contestation than some renditions of the history of neoliberalism suggest. And I try and capture that messiness, that contestation in the history of neoliberalism and the neoliberal order that I write. Great, thank you. And 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 Miriam, let's go to you lastly, but not least importantly, because your recent fabulous book actually uses the term neoliberalism quite precisely. And and um and the term that you use more generally to talk about the ex French colonial experience in Algeria is racial capitalism. So maybe you could say something about the interpolation of how you use neoliberalism and how you see it in relationship to racial capitalism more generally. All right, and just to echo everyone's thanks for this panel and opportunity. Um, I, in many ways, was following the algae to go back to Quinn's uh, metaphor in that I'm not a scholar of neoliberalism, I'm a scholar of, of colonialism in North Africa. And in following the economic debates, um, I was presented with a series of actors and discussions that very much are included in the history of neoliberalism, but perhaps colonial historians have been hesitant to label as such. And so just as way of anecdote, one of the other titles for my book was going to be from homo Islamicus to homo economicus. But I think that the publishers quite rightly decided that that was a mouthful. Um, but that is a way of getting at your question, James, about the fact that this notion of homo economicus is at the heart of my work. Um, and one of the questions that's posed throughout the colonial period is, can you make the Muslim subject into a rational economic actor? And the responses to this change, and even at a given time, people respond differently. But I'm interested in that problematic. So that's one way of getting to the racial capitalism part, which I'm happy to speak more about later. Um, the other point is that my economic planners, which I, I guess I now refer to kind of affectionately as my economic planners, it's what happens when you work on technocrats, um, they are really at this conjecture of the global economic crisis, um, the kind of incipient possibilities of decolonization, um, looking at the horizons of European economic integration, and also very heavily influenced by social Catholicism and, and trying to find a kind of moral injunction for re, um, reinventing the, the market, to use Angus Bergen's term. Um, and so, you know, in some ways, France is often left out of these discussions, except for, you know, a few notable exceptions, because we think of France as having a very statist um, regime of economic control and protection. And I think that that's true. But one of the interesting things is how uh, in thinking about the market, the state, as we know, uh, as people who read about neoliberalism never disappeared. And so I think, you know, to come back to some of the comments that we've been just hearing, um, I absolutely do think that neoliberalism gets conjugated with other kinds of state logics and political questions um, that people have to deal with rather than being a kind of imported model that looks similarly everywhere at different times. Great, thank you all so much. And let's let's move on to a second question that I had for you, which in a way I think brings out some of that some of your responses nicely, because it, it used to be the case that 
the ideas associated with neoliberalism in Euro America were thought to be developed by these um, different thought collectives from the 1930s. But those ideas were frequently thought not to be implemented or put into practice until the 1970s and the 1980s. Um, and yet one of the recent trends that's been going on in the field has been to point to the way in which some of the sort of institutional forms and economic practices that we associate with neoliberalism were actually introduced or experimented with much earlier um, and um, uh, in, in the sort of era of state managed capitalism, um, including some of its colonial forms um, that Muramans has been talking about. So um, how does your work narrate the sort of rise and instantiation of neoliberalism in that way? Some of you have already began to provide an answer to that, but I think it would be helpful um, to go over. Maybe we could go in the reverse direction and start with you, Muriel. Sure, yeah, thank you. Um, in some ways, this goes back to also your question about how do we think about our work in terms of the history of liberalism. And you know, to me, I both wanted to think about that longer history, especially when reflecting on racial capitalism and the way that the subject of property um, and the subject of self-possession was always constituted through a foil of that individual or group who did not have the aptitudes or capacities to be you know, accepted in that social contract. So there's a longer history of thought there, absolutely, that I'm relying on. And, you know, scholars like David Theo Goldberg have written about Rousseau and Kant and, and Locke in this fashion. So I do think there's a larger imaginary and colonial imaginary that I'm drawing from. But I was also very keen to show what changes after World War I. Um, and for me, that comes with a kind of arsenal of techniques and quantitative techniques for thinking about um, things like social psychology, uh, things like public opinion, and ways of aggregating the public good, so to speak, through the market. Mm -hmm. So one axis of my story, although I think it, it falls in the background, is the importation of American social sciences and the ways in which quantification has to deal with um, certain colonial categories. It's really at that intersection where I think some body of thought that we can think about in terms of neoliberalism, in terms of, excuse me, liberalism and its constitutive exclusions becomes a language of technocracy and state planning in an interesting way. So that's my hinge kind of between liberalism as an older trajectory of thought and what happens at, we can call it the kind of neoliberal inception um, in, you know, from the 1930s onwards. Quinn, can we go to you next? Because I suspect that crack up capitalism is going to be charting some of this territory of these spaces in between states that we where we get neoliberal experiments in practice. And of course, your 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 book also covers some of this ground in the 50s and 60s. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know the the statement that that the seeds of the new paradigm are always existing and the paradigm that precedes it is kind of you know self-evident in a way right I mean of course it has to be the case the things don't come out of nowhere so in that sense I feel like one can go down that route and I think Amy Offner's book is an excellent example of someone following that sort of methodologically and her book is called sorting out the mixed economy and actually it's very persuasive to me in showing that many of the things that are often labeled as neoliberal are actually um, well institutionalized decades before and so on. I'm kind of a little more interested, and maybe this is also just in, in, in the spirit of the panel too, to think about the kind of the politics of naming a transition or naming the arrival of a new or the inception of a new paradigm. Uh, and this I think is really one of the things that comes out strongly in the neoliberal age volume, especially in Edgerton's, David Edgerton's contribution, which is, this really strong point that you know we only really start talking about an era of social democracy at the moment that we start talking about an era of neoliberalism. In a similar way, Stefan Link, the Dartmouth historian, writes about how we only really start talking about Fordism when we've declared Fordism dead and we're now talking about post-Fordism. So I think that you know that declaration of a break or the declaration of a rupture, the declaration of an advent of a new paradigm, is you know I think 
poorly taken by historians as simply an act of observation when it's actually an act of political intervention in itself, right? We're actually for helping to produce the new paradigm that we're declaring. And part of me feels like, and I'll end on this, that one of the things that's interesting to me about the, um, the sort of way that neoliberalism as a category is being mainstreamed in the last couple of years, especially in the spaces of the work by people that I, I like a lot, like Rana Faruhar and the Financial Times, for example, and people who are doing sort of commentary on the Biden moment, is I feel like we should pause to acknowledge that it itself is a kind of a, it's an attempt at performative act, right? It's an act of putting to death neoliberalism by allowing it to exist, but only at the moment of its, um, you know, its imminent death. So in that sense, I think it's helpful to say, you know, when we talk about neoliberalism, are we actually talking about this paradigm that existed when, as we now know, we can just go and start poking holes in, the, in it as, as easily as, as anything? Or are we actually trying to make a statement of a new horizon of politics, which is in fact post-neoliberal, and that that's actually what we're talking about, right? We're, we're by deflection, by talking about this previous thing, we're actually talking about our hopes, our optimistic declaration about the direction of policy in the future. So I guess that that's what I would say is this, I think this attempt to sort of, to sort of find precedents um, or declare sharp breaks is almost always in the spirit of celebration or condemnation, right? So we're often either trying to say, this is excellent, we want it to continue, or this is the downfall of something that was previously wonderful. And I think it's impossible to talk about the popularity of the category without acknowledging its sort of resonance as a declaration of new beginnings. Right, but I also hear you saying there that in a sense, what we're engaged in is a type of conjunctural analysis where we can see the ways in which um, various economic and institutional forms that we associate with what I guess we could think of as classic forms of neoliberalism in the 1980s were actually anticipated in at, at earlier moments, um, even before social democracy was declared. Um, uh, or state managed capitalism was declared um, uh, dead. Um, so that's a nice segue. I want to, we want to leave that conversation about how far we're moving out of a neoliberal age or neoliberal era to, um, to the end of our discussion. But it's a nice segue to both Florence and to Gary in the sense that your, um, uh, your work is, uh, Gary, your work especially is very interested in that moment of transition from out of the New Deal political order into what you call the neoliberal political order. So maybe you could tell us about how you see that transition, uh, wh when and where you see that transition happening. Uh, I can, I, if I may, I wanted to say just a word first about the initial question you posed, James, if that's um, permitted uh, on how certain forms of neoliberalism uh, may have had their most uh, well-developed manifestations uh, outside the core nations of the global north and in certain colonial spaces. A helpful way that I have found to think about this is the relationship of uh, liberty to order. Uh, this is very important to someone like Hayek who wants to promote liberty in the world, but you can't have liberty unless it's ordered through constitutions and management of markets and all sorts of other things. Uh, and this was uh, this formulation was dear to the heart of 19th century liberals as well. Uh, Woodrow Wilson, Theodore Roosevelt, very adamant about promoting liberty in America, but also saying liberty without order is anarchy. It's something that they very much dread. The question then becomes, what do you do in conditions of disorder? And where do you find conditions of disorder? Well, you find conditions of disorder among groups who are not quite at the level of white men. Uh, you restrict women from full participation in liberal republics. You restrict the rights of participation of colonial subjects. And uh, you justify these acts by saying, we must have order in order to have liberty. Uh, and certain groups don't have sufficient order. They don't have sufficient self-discipline. They don't have civilization. Uh, they don't. They are not homo economicus to um, bring us back to Miriam's um, important comment earlier. Uh, 
and thus they can be excluded uh, or subordinated in what in, in liberal polities. Uh, and uh, and 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 you can find uh, a greater emphasis on order and repression in some colonial spaces. And then I think it becomes very important to track the way in which some of those practices come back into the metropolitan centers. So I think thinking of liberty in relationship to order and how the two constitute each other, I find that a very helpful way for understanding these processes in a global sense. I don't want to take too much time, so I'll just say very briefly the transition from uh, the New Deal order to the neoliberal order happens in the 1960s. Uh, I don't think we have time today to get into a discussion of what I mean by political order, um, but I do think that there are stress points in a political order. In the U.S., it was race, it was Vietnam, and then it was the reorganization of global capitalism in the 1970s, uh, profound alterations in relations among countries in the global north, and then uh, deep alterations in relations between countries of the global north and the global south. and a series of economic policies that had worked quite well are no longer working, causes a crisis and allows ideas that had been mostly irrelevant in American politics to flood into the mainstream. Uh, and uh, so that makes the 1970s a very important decade of transition. And in terms of how I tell the story, economic crisis is usually implicated in the transition from one political order to another because it creates things are no longer working and uh, it creates opportunities for hit or, uh, heretofore marginal ideas to uh, rush toward the mainstream and bid for influence and power in ways that had not been available to them before. Terrific. Um, Florence, if you don't mind, I'm going to actually move us on because your volume is very much focused upon the sort of story in Britain from the 1980s, it went a little bit back to the 1970s. So I want to actually move on to a question um, uh, that that um, uh, that you've all already um, raised in your responses. Um, because one of the things that's striking about all of your work is that the rise of neoliberalism in the various ways that you understand it was shaped importantly by global or transnational processes. So um, whether that's the rise of mass democracies seeking to manage um, uh, uh, capitalism around some principle of social justice, whether it's late colonial rule, whether it's decolonization, or whether it's the Cold War. So I, I wonder whether you could say something about why it is important to you to think of neoliberalism as a global formation that takes nationally or regionally specific types of forms. And Florence, I want you to begin because your volume in a sense is the most nationally specific of any of, I mean, in other words, in your book, very few of the contributors reference anything outside of Britain in their account of the neoliberal era in Britain. So could you try and explain why that's the case? And that might provide an opening for the others to talk about the different global or transnational processes that were important in their accounts. Yeah, I think um, to start my answer, I'd probably go back to what Quinn just said about the framing of the term neoliberalism arising, the framing of the, the period from the 70s to the sort of, say, 2008, um, kind of arising as people want to critique that whole kind of collection of policies and ideas, just as at the same time we get this upsurge of people talking about the preceding period as so social democratic, because we sort of want a mirror image against which to, to um, kind of define neoliberalism. I think this has been a particularly uh, kind of strong tendency in British politics, particularly with someone like Jeremy Corbyn, and in British academia, particularly in history. And I think it's kind of shaped quite a uh, narrow focus on the nation. But I think if we flip it round, what we see is that, and I, I think this comes out in various chapters of, of the book, People are kind of referring to these broader processes, but 
it becomes difficult, I think, to entirely narrate the period from the 70s to 2008 as one of neoliberalism if we place too much emphasis on forces lying really entirely outside of kind of neoliberal ideas or, or policies. So say take kind of financialization. In the book, various people reference um, the really important work that's been done by people like Vanessa Ogle, looking at how decolonization creates pressures towards financialization. Uh, people like uh, Catherine Shank and Jeremy Green talking about how the development in the city of London of the euro dollar markets in the 1960s is also ends up creating pressures on global financial flows that lead to the breakdown of Bretton Woods and to further financialization. How do we kind of put these into the, the national story, though, if the national story is very focused on the political economy of the state, of political parties, um, of a kind of ideological settlement i think that's this is the kind of um difficulty or conundrum that we end up with if we start with this very nationalistic um this very kind of nationally bounded story of social democracy to neoliberalism because it's just focused far too heavily on domestic political economy on politicians and their ideas and it's quite hard to integrate some of these bigger global economic and political processes into that story. So we end up with a kind of slightly um, sort of awkward narrative. Um, and it's, uh, I think for me, the way to get out of this conundrum is to probably use the categories of social democracy and neoliberalism less um, and to use them in more kind of bounded, um, marked sort of um, constrained ways. Um, Muriel, would you like to um, carry on and talk about that the very specific late colonial context of, of French Algiers and 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 um, and and why it was that um, uh, why it was that the French Empire took such a different route to say the British Empire? And um, so I, I have a slightly different reading to Florence there. I think you can't understand social democracy in Britain without thinking of the centrality of decolonization to it. But in the French case, we have a different formation. So could you talk a little bit about that relationship? Yeah, I think in many ways, um, I'm echoing your very brief comment there in that one of the things I try to show in the book is that notions of economic orthodoxy are actually part and parcel of national myths. So the way that countries think about themselves and the world and their civilizational status is also articulated through their notions of planning um, and the kind of economic ideas that they're bringing to the table. And at the same time, of course, that notion of uh, a national self is only articulated as, um, you know, a as a as a kind of placeholder in a world marked by uh, the Cold War, marked by decolonization and marked by European integration. So in some ways, um, I see both sides of that. Um, and I do see very much to go back uh, to, to Gary's earlier comment, the notion that democracy would be a threat and needed to be um, constrained in some ways, I think is at the heart of many of the anxieties of the decolonization moment. Um, in addition to that, and something that I think brings together the concerns from economic integration in Europe and decolonization is this notion that you know the economy can can fix political problems um right so one of my planners paul de louvrier is very much um, in conversation uh with jean monet about what to do in algeria and there's this notion that um well you know you can use the economy to fix problems that are political and of course this also becomes um a potential response after world war ii in europe so i think there are ways that these these solutions are rooted in national imaginaries, but those national imaginaries emerge with a particular conjuncture of decolonization. And you know, we talk about the Cold War, and a lot of the the work the works we all read today uh, bring up communism as as a, a kind of condition of possibility. And I agree with that. But I think when you work on the global South, communism also means third worldism and the kind of passions of uh, the you know, uh, of um, these uncivilized people. So, you know, to think about this, the specter of communism is also to think about the ways that European planners and colonial officials project 
um, these fears onto the unruly masses of the decolonial of the decolonizing global south. That's great. Maybe we can go um, then to you, Quinn, because um, in Globalist, it's such an important thread of the book that the Geneva School and their progenitors are all trying to escape the national state form under which capitalism can be organized. And so you know, they have different visions of how to organize economic life globally. Um, and decolonization plays an important role in your story in terms of um, the economic arrangements that emerged through the World Trade Organization in particular in the 70s. Yeah, I mean, I think if I'm not wrong, then another way of posing your question is kind of, does a history of neoliberalism have to be global, right? Is, like, can, is it possible to explain neoliberalism without being global? And I think that going back to the four versions of neoliberalism I began with, I think if you have this era version of neoliberalism, which is at some point, sort of global capitalism transitioned into a neoliberal era from which we may or may not be emerging, then certainly that you know, the, the burden is then on you as a historian to say, if so, where did it come from, right? And I think people have offered different persuasive arguments beyond the Mont Pelerin story, right? I think that Vanessa Ogle was mentioned talking about the way capital flight from, from um, former colonies at the end of empire helped sort of producing this fractured archipelago world of uh, offshore sites. Um, Iwa Ong, the anthropologist, has suggested that we should look to East Asia and the sort of flexible enclave zone economies as a place that sort of creates a prototype that could then come back home, so to speak, and help to sort of erode the central control of governments. Um, Ala Davies, the co-editor of the volume that Florence and Ben did, has written about the city of London taking advantage of the explosion of the euro dollars markets and the petrodollars markets as a result of the um, the conclusion of the oil embargo in the 19, early 1970s. So I think that you know there's there's many different persuasive arguments if you want to approach the question that way. And I think if you're taking neoliberalism as synonymous with global capitalism, then you have to, of course, think about this sort of larger global um, space within which an explanation can be convincing or not. I think, though, that even if you shrink down the definition to the one that I was proposing, we might be better off using, which is just as the sort of intellectual movement, the set of doctrines. Even there, I think that my suggestion would be it still needs to be global or at least broadly comparative or put into a sort of a civilizational framework. Because neoliberalism, as I understand it, is not actually um, the attempt to turn the entire world into homo economicus. I actually personally don't think that that's the way that neoliberalism operates or understands itself. I think that in fact, neoliberals um, understand the problem as being what conditions are necessary under the shifting circumstances of human history to safeguard capitalism from its um, strongest competitors and its strongest opponents. And the answer to that is rarely turn everyone into purely utility maximizing actors, right? Almost always the answer is we need to be attentive to extra economic circumstances and conditions, whether that is a certain set of cultural prerequisites, whether it's a certain set of um, resentments that can be drawn on, whether indeed forms of national identity can be constructive rather than destructive for anchoring capitalism. These are not questions that have single answers. They shift over time. And at different points, you see, if for me, interesting ways, um, neoliberal thought sort of transforming internally. So this book that we just came out, put out, that is have almost the same title as Miriam's book, Unbeknownst to Us, Market Civilizations, looks at people who work on places like Japan and India and Brazil and Turkey. And what they find there in place after face, place is really fascinating, which is you see um, the people pushing through what we would consider market reforms of the neoliberal type almost always creating sort of hybrids between a kind of a universal vision of prosperity increasing capitalism with some kind of a local sense of what is Turkish, whether it's the Islamo sort of market synthesis, whether it's a sense that the Japanese are in fact superior capitalists inherently than the Westerners as um, Japanese neoliberals argued in the 1980s. So I think that, in other words, you know, to understand neoliberalism either as a project of reorganizing institutions of the world 
or as the kind of relatively constrained discussions in, in some small rooms that sometimes and sometimes didn't seep into broader political conversations, then yeah, it's always being done in some form of relationality, comparison, um, and it's never done in sort of in sort of the, the the purified, distilled abstractions of freedom as unmarked by race or civilization or culture. Those things are always there. That's great. And as time time is pressing on, I'm actually going to move us on in our conversation and aim a question, next question, uh, um, Gary and Florence, and then a last question maybe for Quinn and for um, for Miriam. Um, and um, I want to start with Gary and, and Florence because both of your work interestingly pushes at this idea that neoliberalism was a popular as much as an elite manifestation and Gary was talking about that at the beginning right at the beginning of our um, uh, session and in some ways Gary's book echoes Nancy Fraser's critique of second wave of feminism by trying to recuperate what we might call the sort of left liberal genealogies of neoliberalism around the understandings of personal autonomy and self-expression that were particularly prevalent in the part of the world that Miriam and I live in the in the in the Tesla driving Bay Area. Um, and Florence was also part of a collective of scholars um, who suggested that there were new forms of individualism that are sort of animated um, and organized working class life in Britain long before uh, the Thatcher era. So I'm wondering if the two of you, and you're going to have to be pretty brief here, but can sort of give us a sense of what's to be gained intellectually and politically from seeing neoliberalism as, and there's two ways of putting this, either a bottom up as opposed to a top down formation or as a liberal, liberal left formation as much as a right formation. Gary, why don't you start? Well, you're right in identifying this as an important part of my book, and I think it's also proved to be a somewhat controversial uh, part of the book in arguing that um, neoliberalism ori originates not simply on the right, but on the left, uh, and specifically in the new left of the 1960s and 1970s. I'm not trying to suggest that the new left was consciously, deliberately trying to bring neoliberalism into existence, but that some of its aspirations uh, converged very nicely and very neatly with neoliberal imperatives. Part of the critique of the new left of the 1960s and 70s is that oppression was coming not just from uh, corporations and not just from capital, but it was coming uh, from a state that had been captured by corporations and capital, a state set up to regulate the economy and the public interest, had been subverted by corporate power, um, capturing regulatory agencies and using those regulatory agencies to uh, advance their own interests and, and undercut the democratic will of the masses. So part of the new left uh, critique became to free individuals from the grip of this force, which was called, for lack of a better term, the system, <laughs> not a very precise analytic term, but one with enormous popularity in the 1960s and 70s. And the question then becomes, how do you, uh, how do you take down the system? You can't just attack corporate power. You have to take down some version of the state. And you also have to free the individual from institutions, both public and private, that have become excessively bureaucratic and, and strangled the values of individuality, humanity, aspiration, um, creativity. And one sees this in, in various forms. Um, I, I, I see it in Mario Savio's uh, cry for free speech and in your place, James, uh, but before you got there, Berkeley 1964, I, I see it in um, uh, in some of the movements toward uh, creating the personal computer and identifying IBM as part of the system and as the enemy. Uh, um, Steve Jobs, uh, Stuart Brand, who created the Whole Earth Catalog, was also creating the personal computer and cyberspace and imagining it as a realm of freedom having to seal it off from all oppressors, uh, public and private. I see it in Ralph, the movement of Ralph Nader, who 
diminish the role of the working class and the conception of class as a, a as a constituent part of society and substituted for that assemblies of consumers who Nader wanted to make sovereign and he was trying to embolden the consumer and and his and her personal and 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 private choices and I see these as efforts to at liberation I don't deny the genuinely liberatory impulse um, of these movements, but they had the effect of eroding and um, and undercutting uh, certain institutions that have been set up to uh, regulate capital uh, and thus facilitated the emergence of neoliberalism in the 1970s and 80s. So it's not so much about intentionality, but in terms of it's it's about the consequences of these um, behaviors. And I also think that understanding that neoliberalism was able to connect to old traditions of visions of freedom and emancipation in America. This is about understanding Ronald Reagan, who on the one hand had an, a lot of neoliberal architects uh, in his among his advisors, but on the other hand was able to tell the American people in a in a persuasive way that he was recapturing the promise of freedom that was the reason America had been established in 1776 and 1789. And, and so the emancipatory component of neoliberalism was real enough uh, to appeal to people across the political spectrum and draw a, a popular base of support that was absolutely essential for turning something that had been created by elites uh, into a society-wide form of power and political order. Thanks, Gary, and I hope, Moritz, that's, that's uh, the beginning of an answer to your um, to the question that you've um, posed in the in the Q Q and A, Florence. Um, uh, how um, would you like to respond to this? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I suppose I do want to disagree with Gary, but the sort of the other thing that I think it's important to kind of think about is how helpful is it for us to see all of these sorts of currents? Um, what I called in the article that you that you reference, um, James, with um, Emily and Camilla and Natalie, popular individualism as the sort of constituent parts of neoliberalism from the bottom up. Because I suppose that, that way of seeing things, I think, is too teleological and it misses the extent to which this popular individualism didn't just lead people to, in some cases, support some neoliberal politicians and policies. It also put huge constraints on what those politicians could do when they were in power. So for example, if you take the NHS or education in, in Britain, there have been some moves to try and introduce certain kind of market-like structures into the NHS and into education, but they've been really limited. And a lot of the things that, you know, full-blooded neoliberal thinkers wanted to do to the NHS and to the education system have just been completely impossible. And I don't think that we can kind of make sense of that without recognizing that the sort of popular individualism that we see kind of bubbling up in the post-war period involves a real sense that actually society and the sort of instantiation of society in the state is there to protect the rights of the individual and to ensure that each individual has the ability to, to kind of fulfill themselves in their lives. This is kind of the um, what Peter Mandler talks about in his book about education and post-war Britain as the sort of democratic impulse in education, which has led to just a consistent expansion in secondary and higher education pretty much throughout the post-war period. You know, people wanted more education. Why did they want it? Because there's, they sort of have this simultaneous belief in the importance of education for all. So there's a kind of universalist collectivist component, but why education for all? Because education is, is connected with opportunity and the development and self-fulfillment of the individual. So that's why I wouldn't necessarily want to see this as, as kind of neoliberalism from the bottom up, because I think that sort of narrows the way that we, that we see these cultural 
um, currents. And I think that they have outlets not only in neoliberal policies and ideas, but also in other really important places that are not neoliberal at all. Thanks, Florence. We, we keep coming back to this distinction that Quinn um, raised at the beginning between the understanding of neoliberalism as the basis of certain forms of subjectivity and the understanding of neoliberalism as a set of of um, as a as a political economy um, made you know made that follows um, uh, that around which certain policies are um, elaborated. So that's great. We're really pushing on time, but I want to try and sneak in two more questions so if the audience can bear with us for about another ten minutes. Um, we'll we'll try and get this done, and then we'll have a space to answer your um, questions that you've been um, uh, been posing. And this is for um, Miriam and for. Um, and for um, Quinn, because um, I want to reorientate the conversation in a certain way, because much of the work on neoliberalism is based around an acknowledgement that it required a very strong state to set markets free. Um, and yet one of the features that we've talked about um, uh, much less has been the gap between the rhetorical emphasis on the freedom of movement of people and labor and the massive growth of the sort of security or carceral state, which especially targeted people of color and those defined as immigrants. And Quinn, your work touches on this a little bit in the case of apartheid South Africa as one of the surprising places where we see neoliberal um, ideas taking route. But, um, how are we to understand this tension between the rhetoric of globalism and the proliferation of tighter immigration regimes and the massive growth of hostile um, uh, immigration systems and highly racialized um, prison populations? Um, of course, one response, Mira, might be, well, this was already there, always already, in the, in, in, in the forms of European colonialism. But, um, uh, I'm interested in your two responses to this um, to this conundrum, this paradox. Do you want to start, Mira? Sure. Um, yeah, and James, thank you for sharing with us your article because I think um, it did a really it, it really helped me crystallize what I'm about to say, which is that there's something deeply unsatisfying also about saying it was already it was already there. This is a colonial history. We know what this is. And that even as tempting on a political register as it is to assert the continuities with the colonial period, I think intellectually we're doing ourselves a bit of a disservice by not taking seriously the new logics that shape how um, you know how these immigration flows and carceral systems are put into place. So you know I think um, yes, of course there was always. Um, an attempt to separate the movement of capital from the, from the movement of bodies. And, and we know that history quite well. Um, but my, my injunction is to take seriously the way that there is both this common imaginary and new techniques and imperatives that need to be dealt with. So I don't see them in tension, but I do think we need better ways of making sense of um, continuity through the decolonization moment. Um, and I also just wanted to go back to this homo economicus point, Quinn, if you'll indulge me for a second, um, which is to say that, you know, I, I don't think homo economicus is an ex actually existing person in the world, but it's a language my planners use. So it's not, it's not a vocabulary that I kind of import into French colonial planning. And so as a trope of, or cultural form, I do think that homo economicus does certain kinds of work, even if it's just to say, for example, in the Japanese context, that look, um, Japan has a cultural heritage that, um, you know, excels at, at these kinds of capacities and aptitudes. But I do think it, it structures uh, a conversation and, and acts as a kind of grammar, even though, of course, this is a form or a trope um, and not, you know, even in Adam Smith's sense, has been uh, rampantly uh, disfigured in many ways. So just I want to be careful on time here. Yeah, I mean, the immigration and neoliberalism question is uh, has many different ways of being approached. I think that one thing I talk about in my book is how as early as the 1930s, um, people who were strong believers in the need for the factors of production to be able to sort of 
you know, go to where they can be used most efficiently, had already made a carve out for, immigra for immigration and the movement of people because they believed that um, under conditions of war, which much of the first half of the, sec the 20th century was, you can't expect governments to accept aliens when they might be threats. So if you can increase the, the flow of trade and, and finance, then you can compensate for the lost efficiencies of the free movement of labor. And that becomes a kind of a set piece in international trade economics beginning in the 1930s. So part of it, um, especially in that earlier period from the sort of the purist point of view of, of neoliberalism is that it's a kind of a pragmatic bending to circumstance, okay, white people tend to be bothered by the, the presence of Asians in large numbers. So therefore something like the Oriental Exclusion Act is understandable given the circumstances. So often it was sort of phrased as a kind of concession. But later on the language sort of changes. So Hayek famously um, supported Thatcher's call to end immigration at the end of the 1970s. Because in his argument, um, by analogy to the arrival of large numbers of Jews from the East in, in, in uh, early 20th century Vienna, when cultural mores are too different, then it can produce itself enough conflict that it starts to undermine the order, which Gary refers to. And I entirely agree that this pairing of liberty and order is a very helpful way of understanding um, the essence of what's being argued for. So there's arguments about sort of disharmony and conflict regardless of low labor costs as being adverse costs that need to be sort of figured in. Um, but the argument is very strong, right? I think I just finished a piece about this, but it's striking to go back to the Wall Street Journal all the way up into the end of the 1980s and see them publish their yearly call for open borders, full stop, right? This is not a call for great more immigration, it's a call for open borders. So this produced a very important schism actually amongst the sort of market liberals, market conservatives, free market movement, however you want to call them, where some people stuck with the Friedman line, which was that you can't have open borders and a welfare state, which is means open the borders and you'll undermine the welfare state. So it's a, actually, there's a positive way to read that, read that. The other side becomes the more conservative position that shades towards the alt-right, which is that some people have cultural values, which make them unable to be productive market actors. Therefore, they're destined to be parasites on the welfare state. Therefore, if, once you take the argument far enough, liberals are actually organizing right, the replacement of native born people with immigrants in a way to win voters in perpetuity and expand the welfare state. So that, you know, this sort of the balance between the way that um, new immigrants can be corrosive to or productive for the welfare state, I think has tipped further away from openness in the, in the internal arguments of neoliberals than, than perhaps it has ever been. It's gone from being a kind of grudging concession to a core part of the way that they understand the way capitalism can work harmoniously is you actually need more often than not to keep populations apart. Unless of course, they rank highly on the kind of the levels of, of aptitude and proficiency that make them positive um, inputs for the economy at a given time. Um, thanks so much. We've really been testing the patience of our audience, but we're going to do it one last time because I really want to get to this question of whether um, uh, neoliberalism is coming to an to an end. Um, and certainly, Gary's book is very forceful in making this argument that, um, uh, which many others have also made, that the financial crash of two thousand eight nine was the beginning of the end because it unleashed both the wave of nativist populisms from Brexit to Bolsonaro um, and the uprisings associated with Occupy, Black Lives, Extinction Rebellion and labor organizing amongst the precariat. Um, but people like Quinn, and Quinn's not alone here, have insisted that basically what we have is neoliberalism constantly adapting, taking shape as it draws on different strands of neoliberal thoughts. I think Quinn has referred to the nine lives of of neoliberalism in, in, in one place and, and other people have argued about there being a new mutant or zombie forms of neoliberalism that have emerged um, uh, uh, and that it's been remarkably resistant to the Great Recession, to the planetary crisis, or even to the COVID pandemic. So I guess the final question is, are we, are we at one of these conjunctures 
where neoliberalism is on its way out, even though we recognize that that may be a long and uneven process. Um, so where should we start? Gary, why do you start with you as you, 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 you have, um, have made this point in your, in your book? Uh, well, I, uh, first I should um, express some humility. Uh, we are all, uh, for myself, I won't express it for the others. I'm a historian. We're all historians. I think we're better at interpreting the past than predicting the future. That's, uh, that's my, uh, that's my uh, caveat. Uh, but I do argue strongly in the book that the neoliberal order is falling. I want to distinguish between a, a neoliberal order that is capable of organizing political thought and the relevant range of alternatives available to a society for making political choice. That has fractured uh, and politicians who were unimaginable in the heyday of the neoliberal order as I described this order uh, in the 1990s suddenly became the most dynamic political players in the world. In America, this was Trump uh, on the right and Bernie Sanders on the left uh, saying much the same things they were saying in the 1990s, utterly marginal then um, and inconsequential in American politics and suddenly the two most dynamic players. Uh, I think that Trump is part of a global turn toward authoritarianism that uh, does not sit comfortably with important elements of the neoliberal order as I understand it uh, and represents uh, decision to go in a different direction in terms of 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 capitalism uh, and uh, and also the in the United States now there's um, a, a left has been reborn that did not exist um, in the 1990s and first decade of the uh, uh, 21st century that is putting forward various kinds of uh, suggestions for political economy, organizing relations between state and society, interpreting equity, questions of social justice in ways that in my reading of the neoliberal order was impossible during its heyday. One of the shorthands I use for understanding whether the uh, neoliberal order is ending, I talk about, sometimes I talk about the four freedoms of neoliberalism. These are different from Franklin Roosevelt's four freedoms of 1941, which had a strong social democratic tinge. These are the four freedoms, free movement of people, free movement of goods, uh, free movement of information, uh, free movement of capital. Uh, this uh, in certain imaginations was the goal of a globalized neoliberal world for capitalism. Uh, and they were accepted in the 1990s uh, in large stretches of the world as, as the way of the world. And each of them has been challenged uh, severely, powerfully don't need to say anything more about how freedom of movement of people is being challenged everywhere in the world now. You could not be a protectionist uh, 15 or 20 years ago and have credibility uh, in economic affairs. And now it's a very, very legitimate position. Managed trade is replacing uh, free trade. We imagine that the world of information that we inhabit, uh, a world of information available to us from every country instantaneously as simply being the way of life from here going forward. And now we're seeing the efforts on the part of various countries, China, Russia, Turkey, among others, to break up this digital universe uh, and create their own digital universes that have gateways to which you have to be admitted. And Ukraine is demonstrating uh, the, uh, the most, uh, has led to the most severe restrictions on the movement of capital that we've seen really since Bretton Woods collapsed and is inclining states to rethink their relationship to the economy and to ask questions of what goods do we need? Where are we gonna procure them from? Can we rely on the private sector to produce them? The answer is no. Do we need an industrial strategy? The answer is yes. So we are seeing a profound rethinking of the role of states uh, in society. And all these uh, elements lead me to think that we are moving into a different world. It's a world characterized by huge amounts of disorder. It's a world of fear. I also think finally that Liz Truss is a beautiful illustration of the collapse of neoliberalism and the neoliberal order. I see her project now as the death throes uh, of, uh, of an order that can no longer be implanted, only she doesn't know it yet. And hopefully uh, she will learn that lesson before the destruction goes too far. But I would say her politics are characteristic of a deep period of uh, disorder and uncertainty. And what used to organize the world uh, can no longer 
do so. So uh, it doesn't mean that right. elements of neoliberal thought won't survive any longer. Uh, I think they will. They will be part of whatever new order that takes shape. But I do have, I do think that we are moving into something else. Um, thank you. Um, do any of the um, the rest of you want to have a stab at this question? I'm not going to ask you specifically, but just un un unmike yourself if you have thoughts that may diverge from Gary's or, or complement his. Um, I mean, I agree with with much of what what Gary is saying. I thought it would be worthwhile just for the sake of keeping cordoned off our different ways of talking about neoliberalism in this session to kind of maybe run quickly through those what I started out with the sort of the four different versions of talking about neoliberalism because when we talked about nine lives of neoliberalism partially we were talking about these mutations of neoliberal thought over the decades so if you think about it in that way I mean I was looking recently at the 2020 well Pellerin Society meeting at the Hoover Institution it was great right Peter Thiel closed it out Neil Ferguson introduced Paulo Guedes who is Bolsonaro's super minister. There was a section devoted to praising the Chilean economic miracle of the 1970s and worrying about the rise of Boric and the populace in the, in the present moment. So from that point of view, you can say that intellectual movement is trundling on. They're well-funded enough, they're not gonna go anywhere, right? Does that mean though, that the other ways of talking about neoliberalism are equally alive and well? I would also agree, no, right? I mean, I think if you talk about it, however, you talk about it in terms of a policy package and a kind of a global paradigm that for sure the kind of assumptions of free movement of goods and money the idea that there are multilateral institutions designed mandated with legitimacy to protect the free movement of goods and money globally that consensus is shattered right the wto has not been able to pass a decision for years china offers a very powerful alternate model that does not fall onto the public private state market format around which the whole neoliberal architecture was designed. Um, the pressures of, of supply chains and, and uh, self-sufficiency on things like batteries and superconductors, I think I completely agree with Gary, that's re reorganizing world, pol world politics and world economics, right? Reshoring is, is a reality now that would be totally, you'd be laughed out of the room proposing this stuff 20 years ago. So I was skeptical from 2016 to 2020 because I think Trump was mostly rhetoric. Um, but since 2020, I think the shock of COVID has actually um, made things actually start to happen in a way they hadn't been before. But lastly, I would say, if we think about neoliberalism in this other way as kind of a self-understanding or a form of subjectivity, it's going nowhere, right? I think that more than ever, people in the United States where I live are subject to the need to constantly monitor their time, constantly monitor their capabilities, and to dole these things out in smaller, smaller portions, just to be able to reproduce their own lives and the lives of their families, right? I think that that injunction to be the entrepreneur of yourself has not, unfortunately, been um, damaged at all in the last two to six years. Can I just jump in really quickly before we go to questions and say that somebody who you know watches North Africa and the Middle East closely and somebody who to some extent um, follows what's happening in the DSA in the US. I think it's also interesting how the cultural forms of neoliberalism are being used sometimes to attack the programs of neoliberalism, right? And so there's an uncomfortable way, I think, in which, um, you know, critiques that something's not sufficiently radical or outside um, can be complicated because you can you can indeed critique this program, yet use a vocabulary of self-making entrepreneurship. Um, and so I think disentangling those is useful. But then the question politically is, um, you know, is that a form of self-sabotage or does that actually, does that mutant actually take us somewhere? Florence, any thoughts? I just wanted to um, pick up on what Gary said about Liz Truss, which I thought was brilliant. Um, I think it's totally fascinating that what we see at the moment is we've got this prime minister who really does seem to be, like Kate said, kind of a slave to the ideas of some defunct economists. And yet we have the markets actually disciplining her government right now in absolutely huge ways. Um, we could talk about that a lot more, but I think probably we want to get onto questions. So I'll leave it there. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and we've got a, a whole series of questions um, that, uh, that have been posed. And I'm going to try and condense them because we're going to um, finish in about um, uh, uh, 15 minutes. So I'm going to try and connect a question uh, 
um, from uh, uh, Moritz Vollmer and one from um, uh, Fatma Shirsi. Um, uh, so the, the question would be, I guess these questions are coming, um, converging around um, the issue of how do we explain the degrees of investment or of how we might think of as the sort of popular success of neoliberal forms of subjectivity and perhaps even some of the economic um, uh, policies um, around them. And someone else, and I, I now can't see, um, refers to the deregulation of air travel, for instance. Another great example for me personally is the invention of the English Premier League, one of the greatest British exports of all time that has actually produced a way better quality of soccer than has existed in the 1970s and 1980s. So how do we think about the success of this project politically, economically, and culturally? And then Fatma is asking us to approach this from the other direction, possibly, and to think of the ways in which that success might have always been somewhat qualified or limited. Um, and she's asking us to think about the different forms of, of social movements that have emerged over the last 30 or 40 years and how we would think about them in relationship to the sort of hegemony of the neoliberal um, project, if we can call it that, um, over the past decades. Um, I don't know if anyone has any thoughts, and if you do, just unmute yourself and jump in. I mean, I can just say something very quickly on this. I think it's one of the dangers of, of taking a cluster of, let's say, uh, human capabilities and, and impulses and virtues and characteristics from sort of enterprise to autonomy, to freedom, to liberty, to self-making, and sort of making them all synonymous with neoliberalism. I think that's um, extraordinarily self-handicapping. Uh, for anyone trying to come up with alternatives, as well as being sort of empirically unhelpful, so broad to be unhelpful. However, that doesn't mean that there aren't moments at which neoliberals have been very adept at tapping into precisely those kind of reservoirs of human meaning making, right? So to take, I'll just use the example of housing, because I think housing in cities is a great place to look at this, right? You could take one example from the global south and one from the north. One could be like the informal housing models of a place like Santiago in Chile or Sao Paulo. There are indeed sort of neoliberals that point to this and say, isn't this great? Look at these people can run their own electricity systems. They manage their own homes. And then the state wants to come in and make them do this and make them do that, whereas they're living full flourishing lives in their own particular way. Um, does that then force me to say that those people like getting by and designing their own homes or whatever, making life work, are somehow incipient neoliberals or neoliberals in utero, and then any sort of policy that would tap into that energy would be condemned as a neoliberal program. I wouldn't want to be in that position. The Thatcher right to buy is another great example, right? I think it's possible to say that the privatization of social housing, of council housing, is a neoliberal move without saying that the desire for home ownership or the pleasure of home ownership is neoliberal quality or is a neoliberal emotion. Because I think then <laughs> you're in trouble then, right? I mean, I think then you start creating this algae-like formation that has swallowed everything that it finds, as opposed to sort of being precise about, are they exploiting, capitalizing, tapping into, or are they then creating and, um, and, and uh, making their own? I think that's a very broad way to answer what is a very broad and important question. Can I, can I say something, James? Or? Uh, pick up on a, a phrase that Quinn has used a number of times, neoliberal forms of subjectivity and how powerful they are. <laughs> I agree with that entirely, and I think there will be a rebellion against it at some point, but exactly what form that's going to take is hard right now to imagine. And we should say that these neoliberal forms of subjectivity go across the political spectrum. I mean, how many of us follow tweets and followers and count everything, count calories, count steps, um, count miles run and walked. Um, it's pretty extraordinary the degree to which this, what 
Foucault called the entrepreneurship of the self has triumphed across the political spectrum. And I'm sure there are rebellions uh, emerging and, and will begin to congeal. I've begun to notice a rebellion in sports um, in American baseball to, to the injunction to measure everything. <clears throat> and here, classical liberalism has something to teach us because the Adam Smith of Wealth of Nations and the creator and the, or the, the theorizer of homo economicus was also the author of theory of moral sentiments. And part of the message was there are elements of human activity that can't be subjected to this kind of calculus of entrepreneurship, love, virtue, uh, democracy, uh, autonomy. Uh, and uh, part of what I think neoliberalism has done is to break down a wall that classical liberalism had set up between what was seen as market activity and what was not market activity. And part of what we've done or part of the neoliberal injunction is to marketize everything. And the idea of classical liberalism was was different. It was to say there are realms of human emotion, association, aspiration that can't be understood uh, through this kind of calculus and calculation. And uh, you know, a theorist who's trying to reestablish that, she wouldn't call herself a classical liberal theorist, she'd call herself a radical, which she also is, is Wendy Brown. Uh, and her political theory is very much oriented toward uh, understanding the human as something other than a series of inputs and outputs that needs to be manipulated. And, and part of moving out of the neoliberal era will find will, will be finding a way to assert other forms of subjectivity. And Florence, maybe we'll come through your popular individualism. You know, there are there's certainly seedbeds there. Uh, but I think that has to be ultimately has to be a very important part of the political project going forward. Florence and Miriam, any, any, any thoughts? I, mean, I was just thinking that the, the question this also poses, which came up in the, in, in the um, chat was about the role of human and the human and humanism, right? Does this take us back? Or is the way to buffer neoliberal um, attacks to talk about the human in new terms and did, you know are we so post-human that that we've lost that as a vocabulary um, so I think humanism is one thing that has come up in this conversation that um, perhaps we could take further but the other is you know and since Bruno Latour just passed away our consciousness of the way that the material world impinges on human nature and certainly on our possibilities so um, I just wanted to throw that out there because it's you know it's interesting to think about Foucault and the entrepreneurship of the self and also um, to appeal to questions of kind of virtue or humanness that we've lost and, and I don't exactly know how to how to make sense of those. Yeah, maybe I'm kind of um, not quite answering the original question here, but I'm um, just picking up on this issue of um, neoliberal subjectivities. There's a couple of chapters um, in the neoliberal age um, by Helen McCarthy and Sarah Mass that look in really interesting ways at how some of the, the sort of elements that we often associate with neoliberal subjectivities were present long before the general period where we think neoliberal, neoliberalism happened um, and were kind of pushed back against by lots of people in the era of neoliberalism. So Helen talks about the way in which women were uh, told that they had to be superwomen, doing it all, having a career, looking after their family in the 80s, 90s, 2000s. Um, but how some of the, the um, most successful bits of popular culture that, that might be seen on the surface as, as marking a kind of capitulation to this actually show women pushing back against the idea that they are going to be superwomen and kind of doing, there's a lot of kind of articles in The Guardian at the moment about quiet quitting but you can see people um in some of the sources that that Helen uses doing a form of kind of quiet quitting just saying I relinquish this this is ridiculous um Helen has also put a really interesting question in the chat about whether it's less easy to understand neoliberal subjectivity than it is to understand neoliberal political economy um or the neoliberal thought collective because it's harder to find in the archive and I think that that is really really true, um, although I think there are some really interesting um, and exciting kind of experiments in, in 
in trying to access that going on by people like Helen and Sarah um, or Ellen Boucher. So, so hopefully it's something that we'll kind of get more of in coming years. Thanks, Florence. And I was actually just about to ask you a, a version of, of Helen's question um, here, which is um, to trying to get us to think not as uh, looking in our crystal balls about when um, neoliberalism um, uh, is coming to an end or taking different shapes, but to think about the work that we have as historians in terms of making sense of its past, its present and its, and its possible future in terms of the different archival strategies that are available for thinking about neoliberalism as a set of subjectivities or neoliberalism as a set of I uh, ideas and, and thought practice or neoliberalism as a set of um, uh, economic practices and, 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 and policies. So I wonder whether any of you have any words of wisdom to uh, folks out there in the audience who may be thinking that they want to engage in histories of neoliberalism, like where would you think would be the great hidden treasure of archival sources in any of those registers that people might turn to um, to begin a new generation of work on this subject? Um, I mean, I can say something that responds to that indirectly. I mean, I think that, you know, this argument that it's easier to find the thought collective and political economy in the archive, therefore there's more work about it than neoliberal subjectivity. I mean, I think that in pure volume terms, that's certainly not true, right? I mean, the term as applied in the academy is much more frequently applied to in the vague sort of Foucauldian sense of being an entrepreneur of yourself than to describe, you know, X number of intellectuals in the 1930s or the actions of the WTO and IMF. It's mostly used in this broad way to mean capitalism nowadays. Right, the vibe of capitalism nowadays. Um, and one way I think it can help, we can help being more precise there. This is a point that Michelle Fair makes in his book, Rated Agency, which I really think is spot on, which is to thinking about financialization and neoliberalism as two things that are not identical. And not only not identical, but that neoliberals were, here I completely agree with Gary very possessed with this idea of order. And the, and the danger of capitalism is always its capacity to create disorder, which then needs to be somehow reordered through some sort of institutional intervention, some sort of new set of social arrangements. When the new liberals were talking, whether it's Hayek or Friedman, all the way up into the 1990s, talking about the future of capitalism, there's no way that they could have, nor did they anticipate the way that finance would transform the world around them. And I would say, and this is Michelle's argument, that financialization has actually sort of set free disruptive and disorderly forces globally that neoliberals themselves are now sort of in fear of. And you can see this in this sort of the cycle of bailouts, right, that, that have, we've watched over the last few decades. This is something that every time it happens, all of the neoliberal intellectuals all condemn roundly and say this should not be done. You can't bail out. Um, you can't bail out Wall Street like that. And yet the new proposal they have for rearranging capitalism afterward only produces the conditions for that to happen again, right? So in that sense, they're this sort of sorcerer's apprentice problem where they sort of helped conjure up these forces that they themselves now have no capacity to sort of rein in or sort of think through to the end in a way that can possibly prevent the disaster from happening again. So I think, and other people have written about this, Aaron Davis, A-E-R-O-N, has a nice article called Separating Financialization and Neoliberalism. So for people wanting to look more into this, I think it's really helpful to keep those lines of in inquiry kind of distinct. Uh, for people who want to work on neoliberalism, there's all kinds of work to be done. I have a couple students, uh, Danny Coleman, Richard Sage, doing really interesting work from completely different ends, Danny Coleman complicating the history of the thought collective coming out of Mount Pelerin in the 1940s and 50s and finding much more diversity of thought there than we had expected. Richard Sage writing a history of resistance to neoliberal imperatives in the 1990s and being impatient with me for having an old, being wedded to an old model of resistance to capital grounded in labor movements of the 1930s and 40s. And, insisting they're, they're all new forms of struggle being invented. So uh, they've taught me a lot of things. And uh, and uh, Florence, reading uh, your book made me realize that 
a book like that couldn't yet be produced in America because the work that had to be done in order to assemble that book hasn't yet been done in the United States on policy issues in a whole variety of realms. Uh, Britain, you know, the study of neoliberal policy here is much more advanced. So you can take stock of, um, of what has been produced and ask the kinds of questions you're asking. Whereas in the United States, a lot of that work has still to be done. And one of the tests of my books is whether neoliberalism will be uh, accepted as a word to be attached to the political era that we are coming out of, because it has not been by historians in the US, unlike historians in Britain. Uh, the term, the favorite term is conservative, which I am challenging. And on the question of a human, uh, a, a liber uh, of liberal, neoliberal subjectivities, there's work to be done in uh, the human capital theorists as they begin to analyze marriage and learning and, and virtue in neoliberal terms. I think if, if I had endless days and years stretching before me, I, I would want to interview all kinds of, uh, of people involved in monitoring their activity um, uh, in, in neoliberal ways without really realizing that to try and understand more about uh, the forms that it takes and whether it's a form of submission or as you were suggesting, uh, Florence, that Helen was doing interesting forms of resistance. I think the most important thing is not to worry about the archives, but to pose the, the, the questions. And if we pose the key questions, what do we have to learn about neoliberal um, um, subjectivities that we don't yet know? The archives and the sources will come. Uh, I don't. I don't worry about that. Um, at all. I think the key thing is to is to pose the question. And as someone who wants to begin thinking about neoliberal forms of sub subjectivity, you can't do anything better than go back to Foucault's um, lectures at the Collège de France in 1978-79. And you don't have to agree with his answers, but his ability to articulate the importance and the power of this neoliberal subjectivity will give you all kinds of thoughts about ways of studying this phenomenon and how it came to be so important in the world we inhabit. Thank you. Um, Miriam or Florence, any final thoughts before we um, uh, uh, wrap up? I'll just say quickly that I think economic history was at the margins of empire for a long time, kind of um, for the last 20 years. And people like Madeleine Woker, who's done amazing work on comparative tax regimes. Um, and I think I do think when working from the global south or in places where the archives are um, either in foreign languages or inaccessible, I do worry a bit about archives, perhaps a bit more than Gary, and think that um, what has been a purview of, you know, I think that that's changed in the last 10 years, but um, also to look at how these discourses and practices have impacted countries um, in after independence, and not only in terms of kind of continuing economic dependencies, but the way that um, nationalisms and cultural authenticity discourses continue to have um, traces of this is something that we should be looking at rather than just siphoning off the colonial as kind of where the action was and now um, everybody's gone on their merry way. I just suggest one um, line of inquiry that I think will be really productive and fruitful is looking at um, the histories of sort of resistance to neoliberalism or neoliberal subjectivities. I think one line of inquiry that is maybe a bit less sexy, but I think would be incredibly interesting, would be looking at the how much neoliberal ideas have infused um, the actions of local government in the UK, because local government does remain important, even though it's hollowed out to quite a large extent under Thatcher um, and I think there would be some interesting stuff to find there about maybe the more kind of banal instantiations of neoliberal ideas in reality. Thank you all. Um, it's been a real pleasure um, hearing you have this um, uh, conversation and I want to thank you all for your um, for your time. It's very definitely beer o'clock in um, in the UK, unfortunately, Quinn and you and I have a little longer to um, uh, to wait, but no doubt we'll be heading for caffeine. Um, I want to thank um, Emma and everyone at the Royal Historical Society. Thank you so much for giving us the opportunity for having this conversation, Emma. Well, thanks are really owing to you, James. Thank you so much for organising and chairing such a wonderful panel. Um, Thank you very much to all our panelists for splendid discussion and to all of our audience for participating and helping to make it such a interesting event.
For closing, I would just like to flag our next event, which is a public lecture held at the City of London, and it will, of course, also be live streamed. In order to mark the 75th anniversary of the Partition of India, broadcaster and historian Kavita Puri will be delivering a talk on the Partition of British India 75 years on, on Tuesday, the 1st of November. Um, as I say, it's in person in the City of London and online, and you can find out how to book on our website. If you are new to the Royal Historical Society, and we are currently very much the Royal Historical Society rather than the British Historical Society, though I hear your uh, suggestion there with great interest, James, do please consider joining us. It's been wonderful to see audience members from all over the globe today, and it's worth stressing that we are most certainly not actually just a British organisation, we are an international membership organisation with opportunities for historians to join us from all backgrounds and at all career stages. So if you would be interested in finding out more about our work and about how to get involved, do please have a look at our website. But with that, I will just say um, thank you very much again to James, to all our panellists, and I wish you all a very good evening. Good night. <laughs>